Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Book Talks, a series of conversations with authors about their books hosted collaboratively by Pittsburgh Theological Seminary's Barber Library and the Center for Writing and Learning Support. We are recording this event. Today, we are focused on the musical legacy of Mary Lou Williams. We're talking with Deanna Witkowski, author, jazz pianist, and composer, whose new biography, Mary Lou Williams, Music for the Soul, is just out from Liturgical Press, September 2021. Her new book tells the story of Williams' life as a musician and a contemplative dedicated to a life of service to others through jazz. Witkowski's book offers a fresh and welcome perspective on the life and music of this legendary jazz pianist, composer, and liturgist, Mary Lou Williams, whose life spanned from 1910 to 1981. If you'll check in your chat window, you'll see links where you can go to Deanna's website and order the book about Mary Lou Williams. Before I introduce Deanna further and launch into our conversation, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Michelle Spomer, Director of Barber Library, and Tisha Wu, User Services Librarian, who've helped make this day possible. They will also be helping me watch for your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, for later on. So please bear that in mind. We'd love for you to be able to ask questions of Deanna as well. Barber Library, for the benefit of all of us, has created a series of library guides, also known as Lib Guides. And these uh, they've done specifically for book talks. You'll see the link for the Lib Guide for today in the chat. If you click on that link, you'll go to the library's website where you'll find many resources linked to our conversation today. And those will be updated as there's more material available. Also, I'd like to thank our communications department, especially Melissa Logan and Robin, Robin Menard for helping us get the word out about this event and our IT department, including Bobby Jarsulik, who is behind the scenes right now, making sure our tech runs smoothly. Again, if you'd like to ask Deanna a question, please type it in the Q&A um, or the chat at the bottom of your screen. I'll talk to her about 30 minutes, give her a chance to read from her book, and lucky you, play, she's going to play a piece live for us during this webinar. So you have come to the right place today. Then we'll turn to your questions. So please join us for the conversation. Finally, you'll note a live transcription button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to read along with us. And so now to Deanna Witkowski, a talented and award-winning jazz pianist and composer herself, Deanna has seven recordings to her credit. These include the recently re released Williams tribute recording entitled Force of Nature on MCG, MG, C, MCG Jazz, sorry everybody, which for those who do not know is the Manchester Craftsman's Guild label. Like Mary Lou Williams before her, Deanna is a musical adventurer moving with ease amongst various musical genres or styles, including Brazilian, jazz, classical, and sacred music. A frequent guest music leader, Diana has shared her original liturgical jazz in over 100 churches throughout the United States. She is a known Mary Lou Williams expert and is presented at the Kennedy Center, Duke University, Fordham University, and has been a featured guest with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. She currently lives in Pittsburgh, where she is a doctoral student in jazz studies at the University of Pittsburgh. She also may be heard live at Cone Alma and in other musical venues around the city on a regular basis if she's not traveling around the United States to perform. Um, so I want to welcome uh, Deanna Witkowski and say we are thrilled to welcome you to Book Talks this afternoon. And uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is congratulations on the uh, nomination of your book, uh, by the Jazz Journalist Association Awards. Uh, it's on the short list of the top five uh, books uh, in biography and autobiography uh, for 2022. Congratulations to you on that. When did you find out? And uh, 
How does it feel? <laughs> well, thanks, Shan. It's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, I found out about this nomination. I think it was last Thursday or Friday. And uh, it's actually for the best uh, books in 2021. And oh, sorry, 2022, just because that's what we're in now. So, yeah, and, and it was, you know, it's great because um, this is my first book. And uh, I was mentioning before we went on the air that there's another really great writer named Bill Milkowski who was nominated for a biography he has of a saxophonist named Michael Brecker. And Bill wrote liner notes to one of my recordings like in 2003. <laughs> so it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice feeling to be now in like a, another community in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. So you're entering into the writing community and you've been in the in the jazz and the music community for a long time. That's really yeah. wonderful. Well, I want to ask you to um, talk a little bit about your long term interest in Mary Lou Williams. Um, how did you begin, you know, your relationship with her that led to you investigating her whole life and writing an entire book about it? Sure. Well, I first became aware of Mary Lou Williams's music. Uh, in 1999, uh, I was invited by the late Dr. Billy Taylor, who was a friend of Mary Lou's, a great jazz pianist, as well as the artistic advisor for jazz at the Kennedy Center to perform at the Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Fest that was held at the Kennedy Center. And when I got the invitation, I mean, of course, I was super excited and I said, yes, I would love to bring my band there. My second thought was, you know, I don't think I really know any of Mary Lou Williams's music. I knew her by reputation only. Uh, in the jazz world, she's known as being a very important early big band arranger and composer mm -hmm. and someone who mentored a lot of other musicians like bebop musicians in the 1940s, like Charlie Parker and Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie. And all of those musicians, I know and have studied their music and I could name a lot of their tunes off the top of my head, but Mary Lou's, I just couldn't. So I thought, I think I better start checking out her music. Uh, so there was there was actually a new biography that, that had just come out then about her called Morning Glory, the first one by uh, Linda Dahl. And I, I started by reading that, and then I got to the section where it talked about how Mary Lou wrote three jazz masses starting in the late 1960s. And I just couldn't believe it because I had just written my first mass setting, which was very jazz influenced for an Episcopal church in New York City where I was working as music director. So I thought, wow, here's this other person who has done this and was a great pianist and composer. Then I started listening to her music. Uh, I contacted a trumpet player named Dave Douglas, who had just done a tribute record for Mary Lou called Soul on Soul and said, what should I listen to? And one of the first records I remember listening to was from 1974 called Zoning. And it's really, um, it's still very contemporary sounding, very, very fresh. And I then I went and listened to some of her stuff from like the 30s when she was touring with this early Kansas City based band called Andy Kirk and his 12 Clouds of Joy. And it was like, is this the same person, you know, and that's one of the things to me that's so great about Mary Lou is that she identified as being an experimenter. Mm -hmm. And she was very proud of the fact that people couldn't pin a style on her, yet her music was very deeply rooted in the blues. Uh, and so she just had this expansive view of what the blues was and, and believed that jazz was really healing music. So all of those things attracted me to her music. Mm -hmm. that, one of the things that did fascinate me in reading your book was this notion of her as an experimenter and an improviser who could hear lots of different musical styles and somehow managed to be able to work with many. I mean, you kept naming different styles that she was able to just step into, you know, from bebop to, uh, I mean, you went, I mean, you gave so many different styles that I could hardly even keep up with them all, you know, um, thinking about how she was playing these different, different things with different bands. Um, and 
um, in some ways, it seemed to me that she was way ahead of her time in sort of, I want to say, messing around with those styles, experimenting with them. Um, and I and it seems like in one point, at one point, you say that some critics were like, well, you know, we don't really know what she is, you know, and so that that created some problems for her musically uh, to be known for something because she didn't have one thing she did. Sure. Um, is Would you say that was a am I reading that correctly? And like, how did that play out for her? Do you think? Sure. Well, I I think that Mary Lou wasn't wedded to one particular style. So, for instance, like if if you after this, if you go to YouTube and you type in Mary Lou Williams Montreux, meaning Montreux, Switzerland, you can watch her play a stride version of, mm -hmm. you know, the man I love. And then she can easily go from that to playing something that's more what we call like free improvisation where there's no not, not necessarily a, a structure a set structure mm -hmm. a form or a specific chord progression that she's following so she has this again very uh expansive swath of her mm -hmm. her playing but yes so there was a period in it's really interesting so in the early 1950s when she goes to europe for the first time she thinks she's going there for two weeks and she ends up staying for two years. Uh, and she does several recordings when she's there for the Vogue label, which is based in England and, and France. And the record, the first recording she does for Vogue in England actually gets a lot of press because it's made to be a part of this controversy about whether or not Mary Lou Williams should play bebop because she's playing on that record, she's so for one thing, she's playing with a bongo player on some of the pieces, uh, which she hadn't done before. She's she's playing in what she calls a more modern style. And when she went to Europe, the the person who was the booking agent who booked these tours she was doing basically was expecting her to play her older styles, more boogie woogie and like very early swing. Mm -hmm. And so there was sort of this you know, this whole um, controversy that erupted, especially in a magazine called Melody Maker, where some critics said, you know, we think Mary Lou should just go back and play her earlier styles. And why is she trying to do something new? And then other critics, you know, defending her and then fans weighing in. And so then there was this ad that came out and said the most controversial record of the year. You know, <laughs> um, so I mean, I kind of think in the end, it, it gave Mary Lou, I mean, at least among musicians, you, and those, you know, in the know, like real jazz aficionados appreciate that she she has this expansiveness. Mm -hmm. But I do think and I still think it's the same today. I mean, mm -hmm. I could tell you that for myself, you know, I play a, a lot of different styles of music, a lot of different styles of jazz um, and sometimes you know and i have some recordings that are specifically sacred music specifically mm -hmm. liturgical music and then i have latin jazz and you know and all different things and then when when you start to talk about labels you know it's mm -hmm. it's very it's always a frustrating thing because a label you know i mean delineates the fact that you have limits you know mm -hmm. to what a label says so mm -hmm. Mary Lou definitely went beyond that. And I, yes, I do think that sometimes that made it harder for mm -hmm. her to have uh, certain things happen in her career. But on the other hand, no, I don't think it was a detriment. It, it may have also sold a few records, at least in Europe. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can tell you, though, that there is still, um, I think, among a lot of uh the jazz community, this, you know, a misconception about when we talk about, so Mary Lou in the latter half of her life, after she converts to Catholicism at the age of 47 in 1957, she starts writing liturgical music, but she didn't leave her other music behind. Mm -hmm. And there is still this misconception that after, you know, 1960, I don't know, two or something like that, um, that Mary Lou, except for these like two records in the 70s uh, that she 
mostly did sacred music mm -hmm. and that she wasn't wanting to do other kinds of music, which really isn't true. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, again, it was another part of her repertoire and something that she mm -hmm. focused on for quite a while, but it was a piece of her larger, larger, you know, musical repertoire. Yeah. And I, you know, I noted that um, toward the end of the biography, you say that, you know, in that latter period of her life, she, you say, you know, she had fully integrated her spirituality, her music and her love for teaching, um, you know, so she, she was able to integrate it all at that point, but it had been kind of uh, various things sort of firing at different times and not all lined up until she kind of worked at it for a long time. And I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking is like, you make the point at one point in the book that, you know, she's really dedicated to serving others and to developing community with other musicians and supporting people that were having a hard time either because of poverty or particularly she was interested in people that had drug and alcohol addictions and supporting those, those people in the jazz community. And so she was doing that, but she was doing it like it was hard for her to balance that with her music. So she would do her music and then she would use all the money from that, you know, to fund these, these uh, service projects that she was doing to help other people, but then she would just run herself all the way down and she never, she didn't get it in balance and, until later um, in, in her life. At least this is what it seemed like to me, which was kind of interesting because it was like everything she did, she did 150%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I think so for one thing, um, it's not until the last four years of her life that when she's teaching at Duke University that she has like a steady income. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that makes a huge, huge, huge mm -hmm. <laughs> difference. So, and also throughout her career, which was a six decade career. I mean, Mary Lou was, you know, born in 1910 and she died in 1981 and she started performing professionally when, when she was just in her early teens, you know? Mm -hmm. So she had an almost six decade career for most of that career until like the last, well, say, let's say the last third of her career, she had managers on and off, but never a consistent manager, never a consistent person doing booking for her. There were a lot of things that she was having to take on herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is something that, you know, I feel that I can commiserate with her on because I understand what it is to, you know, be self-represented and to be handling wearing so many different hats all the time. So but also, you know, her income was was not always flowing uh, mm -hmm. in, in the way that it needed to be just to support herself. And then let alone, she would send money back when she could to her family mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. So she's from mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, but she lived in New York starting in 1943. Um, and, and then giving away what she had for people she would house in her apartment in Harlem. So basically, I mean, she moves to New York right around the time of the Harlem riots in 43. And she she's been in Harlem a lot before because she's been through town performing with Andy Kirk's band and at ballrooms that were then closing or had just closed like the Savoy. So mm -hmm. she actually sees the neighborhood change mm -hmm. and for the worse. Mm -hmm. And she wants to do something about it. She She's someone who's very compassionate and generous. And whenever she sees someone in need, I mean, she just would try to help them. So even this is way before her conversion to Catholicism, she's bringing people into her home. Mm -hmm. Then she starts doing that, you know, after her, I mean, conversion, and that's a whole long, long story. She mm -hmm. forms a nonprofit organization called the Belcanto Foundation, which mm -hmm. the proceeds are meant to help musicians who are basically suffering from drug addiction. And she wants to have at this point, this never materializes, but she wants to have like a center or a home somewhere outside the city, say in upstate New York, mm -hmm. where musicians can go and experience rest and have what I believe. I, I believe she also had this idea because by this point she had been starting to go on spiritual retreats. Mm -hmm. So she wanted and that's part of what attracted her to the Catholic Church was having a space that she felt 
was quieter and where she could mm-hmm. meditate. And mm-hmm. she felt that that was something that a lot of musicians in New York City were missing and mm-hmm. partially what led them to have certain problems. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she was she was really trying to look at how to help the whole person and she wanted mm-hmm. to connect the jazz musicians who had particular needs with church communities and with audiences at jazz clubs who she felt should be taking care of the musicians. So she had definitely this wider idea of what community was about. Mm -hmm. You know, you you brought up something that interested me and I made a, a note in my book to ask you, which is you know, it seems like there for her, there was she had a clear sense that her life of prayer was connected to her creativity as a musician and her uh, both in terms of composition, but also in terms of playing and that at sort of dry times in her spiritual life that she just felt like she didn't have anything to say as a musician anymore either. Um, can you talk about that some? I mean, in, how do you see that with her? Well, I think that the word prayer, I mean, you know, for Mary Lou, she talked about at a certain point, her playing being prayer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she, she also would talk about jazz coming from the mind, you know, to the heart, through the fingertips, to her instrument. And for a while, when she was in the process of converting, which was this was about a three year process, um, she during that time, you know, she had started going to this Catholic church in her neighborhood in Harlem just during the day because the doors were open. And she said, you know, and so she just went in there because she felt a kind of serenity there that she didn't feel in other spaces. And, and she had been looking for some kind of a spiritual home. So she starts to write out while she's going to this church every day, she starts making a list of names of people to pray for. And Mm -hmm. and, and in her mind, that list is, the prayer part is bringing that person to mind and, you know, in some way, like presenting them to God. So her Mm -hmm. list gets really long. She gets Mm -hmm. to a point where it has 900 names on it. Mm -hmm. And the way again that she uh conceived of prayer that meant she had to be in church a really 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 long time (laughs) every day to be able to bring every person to mind or you know to bring their intention um and so it's really you know through certain jesuit priests this one priest named father anthony woods who was at uh, saint francis xavier church in chelsea in new york city that he helps her to uh, learn different forms of prayer Mm -hmm. so that she doesn't have this weight on her where she feels, Mm -hmm. because again, it's almost an extension of, she feels responsible Mm -hmm. for each of these people's well-being, And she just knows she wants to do whatever she can. Um, So if that means sitting in church for six hours to pray for everybody, she's going to do it. Um, But, you know, but, her and that's a very ascetic lifestyle too Mm -hmm. so she had you know and for a while she had this attraction to becoming a woman religious to becoming a nun Mm -hmm. and she had many friends who were nuns who she would befriend on her spiritual retreats and then start writing letters to them and Mm -hmm. and you know i really believe she created a whole network of support um that way but with prayer, I think that it was also through the influence of people like Father Woods that she gradually came to a place where she could recognize that her music was also a form of prayer and healing for mm-hmm. other people, and that uh, you know prayer wasn't always necessarily going through every name or even speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so her conception of prayer changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems, it seems like there were some like competing sensibilities in her, I guess, like it, it for at the first, uh, for a while, um, in her life up into the point where she converts and begins to really get some spiritual guidance, I guess I would say from Jesuits, from nuns, um, 
and 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 some Franciscans as well, as you know. And, um, you know, so she's she's sort of got like she's a performer. So that's an external sort of posture to the world, you know, where you're engaging with fans or with the audience in some way. And you're negotiating with the business side of things. But then there's also the side of her that was a contemplative. And I felt like um, some ways that those two uh, things didn't always go together well for her um, at the, you know, in the first parts of her life. And that some of some of the, the trouble that she had in her life or the difficulties she had in her life were born of that tension, mm-hmm. you know, of, of the tension between what it means to be a public figure you know, like you, you talk about when she goes to Europe and she gets there and, and hides because she realizes the press is looking for her because she's so famous in Europe and people are so excited about her being there. And she hides until she sneaks away to a cab and then some reporter like jumps in the cab with her and manages to get some kind of interview out of her in the cab. And she's not exactly thrilled um, about a lot of that. So. Sure. That incident is actually in New York um, in the 40s. Oh, what? What? Right. I think that was in Europe. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Because that's in kind of the height of her popularity when she's with Andy Kirk's band. And, you know, and in the black press in black newspapers, which, you know, were really, really uh, important, like in the for I mean, for Mary Lou's career, for one thing, um, she was a very known figure. So. So, yeah, that's that's that. But I, you know, I I think for so for one thing, um, I think a lot of performers, I mean, I count myself as somebody who is I'm I'm not an extrovert and I'm a performer. <laughs> You know, it takes me a lot of energy uh, to do what I do, but I do it because I love to do it and to share music with people. And for Mary Lou, it took her a lot of energy uh, to be able to perform. And at certain points in her life, when she was questioning the environments that she was playing in, it took even more energy. So especially when she was seeing friends who were dying of heroin addiction, you know, Mm -hmm. and nightclubs were a place where that drug was unfortunately easily available and and pushed on some musicians. Mm -hmm. And she also felt like she didn't want to be a part of that Mm -hmm. at all. Um, So that's kind of, you know, one one thing but mary lou was someone who one-on-one she would always talk to people who came up to her after a gig and she had so many people who would you know write her letters and say how a kind word she had given them after a performance had touched them or a specific performance and then she would always send them you know give them like a recording and then she would she would have to go to the post office and send it i mean you know (laughs) so it wasn't it, it she she did a lot of work to try to keep to help people feel that they had a reason to keep going really but i i think um for her, you know, there were, she, I think in some ways she was a shy person. Mm-hmm. She was also a very stubborn person. And, you know, and she knew, like, for instance, I mean, she was very hard on bass players. So, you know, with, say, if you're playing duo, like just piano and, and upright bass, acoustic bass, or piano bass and drums, and she would change the form of a tune or add a section or add different chords or something and get mad if the bass player couldn't follow along. And then she would be, you know, very demonstrative in saying like what she thought and, you know, really. So that was a different Mm -hmm. uh, stance kind of than the shyness kind of thing Mm -hmm. that she would sometimes feel with audiences. But then you also see her like, you know, I've seen enough videos of her by now i mean in her later life where she you know whether she's i don't think it matters too much if she's shy or not i mean just the way she engages with the audience is she's perfectly comfortable and she's like mm-hmm. laughing and having a great time and and there's there's no sense of holding something back 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you tell that story toward the end of the book where she's teaching at Duke University and she um, she goes into the class for the first time, doesn't say anything. And I mean, just even walking in, they all go. They've never met anybody like her, seen anybody like her at Duke University. And and she walks in, sits down at the piano, plays and then gets up and walks out. <laughs> and they're all like. I can't wait to come back to class. I mean, it, it felt, you know, I could feel that uh, because her presence was so powerful. Yeah. And her, she was clear about what she was doing, too. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. That story that was so I interviewed Father John Deere, who uh, mm-hmm. was formerly a Jesuit priest, mm-hmm. and he was a student of Mary Lou's at Duke. So, he, yeah, he, he described his first class with her. It was a history of jazz class in a large auditorium, and she was late to the first class. So the students were waiting, but they were all just, you know, talking whatever, making noise. And then when she came in, he said it took her like 10 minutes to walk from the door to the grand piano on the stage. And she was all dressed in black and wearing like a black paper mache rose and black tights, a black dress. And then she, you know, John said she played for an hour that she, you know, played boogie woogie and she went through her history of, of jazz demonstrations that she would do, but she doesn't say anything. And then at the end, she, she said something like jazz is love and I'm going to teach you love through jazz. And then she stands up and leaves. Wow. So, and her class was very popular. I mean, you know, she had at one point, I think there were about like 750 students that were trying to register for a class where they could only take like 150. So. Yeah, that's incredible. That's just incredible. Well, I am mindful of the time. So um, we've asked you if you would be willing to read a little bit um, from the book so we can uh, the audience here can hear it. Um, And I want to remind the audience while uh, Deanna's um, picking her passage, um, just if you have questions, please post them uh, in the uh, Q&A. We'd love for you to be able to do that. And I'll be voicing the questions on behalf of the audience. Um, So, Deanna, take us away to Mary Lou's world for just a bit. Sure. So this excerpt is picking up uh, in 1962, and this is a period where it's about five years after her conversion, and she's still not performing super regularly. Um, And this is also going to reference a Franciscan friar who was African-American named Brother Mario Hancock, who Mary Lou was good friends with. Even though Brother Mario and other friends continued to encourage Mary, she was still hesitant to perform regularly and seemed to appear and disappear from the jazz scene like a jack-in-the-box. It was not until 1962 when she accepted an offer from her manager, Joe Glazer, for a three-month engagement at a San Francisco hotel bar that Mary stopped retreating from the public eye. To ease her anxiousness, Glazer asked Mary's friend, Louis Armstrong, then in California, to check in with her. Besides Armstrong, Mary befriended the local actor Lloyd Bridges on her nightly trio gig with bassist George Tucker and drummer Al Harewood at the Tudor Room inside the Sheridan Palace Hotel. In an interview in the local Archdiocesan newspaper, The Monitor, Mary mentioned a nun who had helped her find her way back to the piano. Reporter Tom O'Leary listed the sister only as a Martha, excuse me, a Mother Mulligan, a Seneca nun who once insisted Mary Lou practice the piano while on a retreat in Mount Kisco. In the late 50s, Father Woods had contacted Sister Martha Mulligan at the Seneca Mother House in Mount Kisco, New York, to help Mary make what was probably her first spiritual retreat. The Seneca's stated mission is to surrender their whole lives to God through prayer, community, and spiritual ministry, exactly what Mary had been doing through her music and works of mercy. Beginning with Mary's first visit, the two women became soul friends and wrote consistently to each other for more than 17 years, often as frequently as every two weeks. In an April 1978 letter to Mary, Sister Martha recalled, quote, I was reminded of Father Woods' phone call to Mount Kisco asking me to take you on the retreat. He said, 
You know Mary Lou, don't you? No, I never heard of her. And Wood said, well, you're going to hear a lot about her. She's somebody. Sister Martha and Mary offered each other mutual encouragement through hard times. In her letters, Sister Martha constantly reminded Mary that she was praying the Memorare, a prayer invoking the Virgin Mary for protection, daily for her and for her Pittsburgh relatives. As Mary began touring more regularly in the late 60s and 70s, Sister Martha employed her to take time to rest and scheduled occasional retreats for her at various Seneca facilities in the Northeast. Sister Martha also relayed her struggles of living in limbo for a year after her longtime home at a Seneca Center in Lancaster, Massachusetts was slated to be closed. Moving to a large mother house in Boston, a city she did not like, Sister Martha asked when Mary would perform her liturgical music at Boston College, something that Mary eventually did do in the mid-1970s. Sister Martha later spoke of her sister Helen's death and consoled Mary in 1965 after she expressed her sorrow at the death of her beloved spiritual confessor, Father Woods. Mary sent Sister Martha recordings and newspaper clippings covering her performances, which Sister Martha posted on the sister's bulletin board and preserved in a scrapbook. Sister Martha occasionally traveled to Manhattan for Mary's performances and prayed for her in the Seneca Chapel when she was unable to be physically present. In Sister Martha's last known letter to Mary in the spring of 1980, just one year prior to Mary's death, her handwriting is noticeably shaky. She apologizes for her penmanship, writing that she can barely hold her pencil because of two recent falls. In many of her letters, she exhorts Mary with the phrase, keep your heart high. Mary was strengthened to continue to share her music with the public because of deep friendships with religious like Sister, Mar Sister Martha and Brother Mario. Returning to New York after her San Francisco performances in the spring of 1962, she was about to be strengthened by a 17th century black saint. And that's a cliffhanger for those who haven't read the book yet. <laughs> you can yeah, learn more about that. That's saying that saying the St. Martin de Porres. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then she does a whole album uh, dedicated to him. That or has a title called Black Christ, right? For him, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's incredible. I was listening to a piece from that just to earlier today to sort of get in the in the mood, and it is an it's amazing, um, really, really beautiful work. Um, so it seems like that somehow she found um, she found a home, a spiritual home in the Catholic Church with and amongst these folks. And she was really embraced by them. I mean, she had, it's almost like she had a phalanx of, you know, priests and nuns and all kinds of people who were accompanying her um, and, and urge encouraging her on her way. Um, which is so fascinating because it gave her a, a whole new life. It seems like. Yeah. And again, you know, I think one of the, to me, the most, fascinating things of my research was um, getting to read letters in Mary mm -hmm. Lou's archive that are housed at Rutgers University at the Institute of Jazz Studies, which is where, you know, the letters that I referenced um, with this relationship with with Martha Mulligan. And mm -hmm. so Mary Lou, I mean, she, you know, as I, I think it, it seems like she kind of stepped into a community, but I think she also created that community too. Mm -hmm. And what I find really interesting about the beginnings of her conversion process is is actually a priest who is stationed in uh, South America. I think he was in Paraguay and he goes to, so Dizzy Gillespie, the trumpeter, is on a State Department tour through South America He's down there with his wife, Lorraine, who is in the process of converting to Catholicism. And this priest, Father John Crowley, just introduces himself to Dizzy and Lorraine after this gig and says, hey, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of Mary Williams and I haven't heard anything about her for years. You know, what's going on with her? And like literally to me that 
that is a point where the three of them kind of form this little, you know, pact that they're going to help. They're going to help Mary Lou because Mary Lou was very close friends with Dizzy and Lorraine. So when Father Crowley goes back to the States for a visit, uh, Lorraine convinces him to visit Mary Lou in her apartment in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And then it's through uh, these three that and Barry Ulanov, who was a jazz critic, who also had converted to Catholicism from Judaism um, and taught at Barnard College, that then she was connected with Father Woods and then more and more of the Jesuit community. And then the nuns have really kind of just came, I, I believe, primarily through her spiritual retreats and the letters that, you know, she she wrote and that were that were responded to as well. That's just, it's, it's a really incredible story. And I mean, you have to thread all these relationships together and stuff. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep up with all these people, but it's pretty, it's amazing. Um, now I'm starting to see a few questions in the chat, but before we do that, I'd like to invite you to play. Um, and, uh, and then, because I think some of the questions I'm seeing will follow well on, uh, your, your, the piece you're going to play. Sure. So I'm going to play something that I recorded. I'll hold it up so you can see. So this is a, my new recording, Force of Nature, and it has uh, 11 compositions by Mary Lou on here, as well as a few pieces that she didn't write that she performed a lot. And then the title track is something I wrote for in tribute to her. So I'm going to play something from the late 30s that she wrote when she was with Andy Kirk's uh, Clouds of Joy. And I um, I like playing this tune a lot because the solos actually go between two different keys, so it makes it really fun. So this is called Lonely Moments. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much. It's so fun to get a ringside seat and to get to see you play and, and watch your hands. And it's, it's so wonderful. What was the title of that piece again? Lonely? It's called Lonely Moments. Lonely Moments. Okay. Wow. And that was an earlier piece from her time yeah, in the, with the clouds. Is that right? Yeah. So it's from mm-hmm. around 1938. And on my recording, mm-hmm. it's a so we play that one where there's it's trumpet, piano, bass, and drums. Most of the recording is, I mean, there's there's about four tracks with the that instrumentation, and then there's two actually two different rhythm sections. So it's my long time band from New York uh, on on most of the tracks, and then on three tracks I'm playing with people here in Pittsburgh with Dwayne Dolphin on bass and Roger mm-hmm. Humphreys mm-hmm. on drums. Wow. Great, great. You have such they're great musicians here. Uh, just amazing, including yourself. But I mean, you know, it's just a w- wonderful community. Um, I have a statement from uh, one of our um, our uh, audience uh, members who says, I love the title. And I think that the person means force of nature uh, saying I love the title um, and it seems to capture her and the music and community. Um, and uh, the Diane who wrote that, if, if I'm wrong, uh, saying that force of nature is what you're talking about, please uh, make another uh, note in the chat. Um, in the meantime, we have some uh, questions about some of your performances, Deanna. Do you want to sure. say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd actually like to say something about the title. Oh, cause yeah, cause please. Behind the title. So that phrase force of nature, the, you know, what happened was when I came here, so I moved here a year and a half ago from New York where I lived for over 20 years. But a year before that, I came here for two months doing research for the book. And I was hanging out a lot, going to hear musicians and Con Alma, which is a restaurant and jazz club had just opened in Shadyside. And mm-hmm. one night I was there and I sat in or something. And one of the owners, John Shannon, who also curates the music and is a guitarist just said to me, he said, Deanna, you're a force of nature. And my first thought was, this is a song title <laughs> or this is an album title or something. So I use post-its all the time. So I went back to the room I was renting in Morningside because I wasn't living here yet. And I wrote force of nature on a post-it. I stuck it on a mirror. And then a few weeks later, I was meeting with Marty Ashby, who works at Manchester Craftsman's Guild here. And he just wanted to know how the book was going because we'd been in touch for a while. And I said, oh, you know, great, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, you know, it would be really great if I could do a recording of Mary Lou's music because I want people to, you know, put down the book and go listen to her music. But, you know, also my arrangements of her music. So Mm -hmm. he said we should do that. So, you know, what we did was also graphic wise, this is my handwriting. So Mm -hmm. they took this from the post-it note um, to use for the cover. And then I hadn't, I didn't have the title when I, you know, met with Marty and I just thought I have to write a piece called Force of Nature. Mm-hmm. Because, yes, that is exactly, Diane, that how I think of Mary Lou. And, you know, really because of her, I moved to Pittsburgh and she was a force in so many um, people's yeah. lives and musicians' yeah. lives. And, yeah. So yeah. For that comment. I know, and we haven't even gotten into all that. I mean, there's so much to talk about. I, I was like, I don't know where to start. So I figured we'd just go organically. But, I mean, we could talk all about, you know, the many people that she engaged with in so many different ways. Um and and mentored, you know, wrote, composed for, uh, played with. I mean, in, incredible, incredible numbers of people, all of whom seem to respect her and admire her quite a great deal. Um, uh, we have some questions about um, your your playing of her music um, and liturgical masses. Um, and one of them is, what was the reaction of the congregation to um, your first liturgical mass, the first time you performed it, um, did any of them express any sort of new or enhanced encounter with God? Well, you know, when I wrote my first mass setting, um, it was for a specific community uh, for All Angels Church, an Episcopal church on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And they, I was a new music director at the time, but they had this tradition of music directors writing new mass settings for so like something like the second week I was there, this group of parishioners approached me and was like, when are you going to write us a mass? You know, <laughs> it's 
like, okay, well, yeah, I was planning on doing it. I mean, not maybe the second week I got here, but um, we actually, we did it over stages, you know, since I was with a specific mm-hmm. community. So for instance, mm-hmm. like, I think I wrote the Santus first and I taught it to the gospel choir without written music. And then we would actually, you know, I know this isn't liturgically correct, but like we would sing it as a prelude one week so people would hear it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, before they had to sing it, or then like we had a retreat, a uh, weekend retreat. And then I taught everyone the Gloria because it was like the most complicated part of that setting or something. So we did it over time. And I mm-hmm. definitely, you know, um, I would say, I, I don't know if I remember specific reactions to that, you know, that moment what i what i really do remember a lot though because that church still uses my sanctus Mm -hmm. is the sense of community like Mm -hmm. of everyone singing the piece together and some people wanted to learn it with written music so i have that some people no um and so we had different you know ways that people could learn the music but there was just a very uplifting sense of joy Mm -hmm. about that piece, you know? And so, and I've had, I've had many people tell me over the years that, you know, I'll get comments like, oh, we didn't know jazz could work so easily (laughs) in the service, or it just kind of flowed, or people just expressing that they had a kind of like a deeper um, engagement with, you know, Mm -hmm. the text that they were singing, Mm -hmm. Um, just hearing, you know, different, harmonies or chords that you know underneath them even with hymn tunes because i also did a recording that's all uh called makes the heart to sing and it's all just like very well-known hymn tunes that i i did all the arrangements for congregational singing so people could sing the melody they know but everything underneath is different Mm -hmm. and it just again gives people a sense of surprise i think a lot Mm -hmm. um that is often missing and you know, in in liturgy, sad to say, or mm-hmm. or things that we do over and over, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's like you need to have new elements sometimes to just bring something out in a new way. Mm-hmm. It helps people pay attention in a whole new way, right? For sure. Wow, that's really interesting. So another question is, um, what have been your favorite sacred venues for your performances, and what have you liked about those particular venues? Well, I guess I just more think about people at places I've played, you know, I, so I can tell you the first thing that comes to mind is maybe, uh, I don't know how long ago now, five or six years ago, my trio, uh, we traveled from New York to Richmond, Virginia, and we played at an Episcopal church at St. John Episcopal church. And it was a church where like Patrick Henry gave a speech, you know, so like there's, they do all these reenactments and things there. But anyway, the building itself is really small. Um, and, but the music director who is not there now, but at the time, he com- made a combined choir with some people from the St. John's choir and then uh, some singers from another choir from a local AME church mm-hmm. uh, to sing some of my music. And we put together a jazz Vespers. And again, all the people sitting in the pews had, for the most part, never heard this music before. And that was one of the places where I felt the most strongly that like everybody was participating, everybody was singing. And what I also loved about it was, you know, everybody looked different from each other. I mm-hmm. mean, and so mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, this is what I want church to be, you mm-hmm. know? So um, that I think was one one place, yeah, that just really comes to mind. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I, I love that focus on people, not necessarily the space, but the people there. Yeah. Um, another question uh, from people in the audience are, is um, what was the response um, to Mary Lou's conversion to Catholicism by fellow musicians, general public, family, friends? Um, <laughs> what kind of assumptions did people make and, you know, what kind of impact did it have on her career? Well, there are a lot of musicians who really thought that she had gone off the deep end. You know? So, I mean, Miles Davis, you know, joked and called her Reverend Williams, which, you know, 
you could, I don't know, take that how you, how you want to. I mean, that mm -hmm. would really bothered, bothered me. Mm -hmm. um, Polonius Monk, who was a very close friend of Mary Lou's fellow pianist, he, uh, he actually was someone who Mary Lou brought with her. Like she kind of dragged him to church. And I tell a story in this book that she mm -hmm. talked about in numerous interviews where he was scared to go to church because he said he had never been inside a church before. And I guess he thought lightning was gonna hit him or something, I don't know. So he drank like a pint of wine before they got to the church. And then he's like, as Mary Lou describes it, you know, he was falling down on the steps as they went up the steps to like enter the sanctuary. And, you know, she called him like a big ape and, you know, or whatever. Um, so Monk was also someone who she found like sleeping in her spare, you know, bed in her apartment one time when she goes home and she had left the door open and he wanted to show her a composition he was playing. And she said, you know, she walked in the bedroom and he like freaked out and you know, whatever. But anyway, so there, there were definitely musicians who, you know, didn't think what she also, but on the other hand, you know, when she formed the Bel Canto organization, she also had thrift stores where she gave the proceeds. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes meager, but gave the proceeds to musicians in need. And, and I've seen, um, you know, records of, specific musicians who received like $15 or something mm -hmm. who she was really helping at the time. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, people who, whatever they may have thought of her, you know, religious choices or conversion were helped by Mary mm -hmm. Lou. And yeah, so I, I, I think it was, you know, a mixed bag and also just in terms of, uh, her manager for the last 20 years or so of her life was a Jesuit priest named Father Peter O'Brien, who I became friends with. And, you know, he had always thought that Mary Lou should keep doing like more of her arrangements of standards and more instrumental originals. But she also wanted she wanted to do that, but she wanted to do her sacred mm -hmm. music more, too. Mm -hmm. So one last question. We're at 501, so we're running a little late, but I do want to get this question in from an audience member uh, because I think it's a great one to end on, which is, are there specific ways in which Mary Lou Williams has inspired you musically, spiritually, and otherwise? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Mary Lou, for the one one big thing I think of, is that Mary Lou followed whatever, you know, what she heard, like her inner voice or whatever you want to call it. I mean, even before she converted, like if, if she believed she was supposed to do something, mm -hmm. she didn't really question it. I mean, she she just went for it and she entailed a lot of risk in her life, you know, for that reason. Um, and that's something that I feel like I've had to, you know, I, I talk to her. I mean, I, you know, moving here to Pittsburgh has been a big, continues to be a big change. And it was, it was a crazy thing to learn when I, I bought a house. I'm here in the Greenfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And it took me about six months to realize that my house is a mile from her gravesite. Wow. So, um, so I, you know, I've gone there a few times and, um, mm. and I, I don't I don't even know how to exactly express this, but I think there's just this underlying like Julian of Norwich thing that all shall be well kind of thing mm -hmm. um, that Mary Lou exemplified. And she also, you know, exemplified the thing where, you know, like all the times in the Old Testament where God tells people to like leave where they are and go somewhere else. You know? mm -hmm. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't want to do this, you know, or whatever. But just that there's a there's a sense of like following through and doing what has to be done. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that musically, um, for me, it's it's really Mary Lou's willingness to experiment and to play mm -hmm. a, a lot of different kinds of music and to also be as generous as possible in having other people like in the case of my sacred music have other people sing my music 
and you know making piano scores so the church musicians who aren't jazz players can can play them and things like that because that's something that she did too and mm -hmm. so it's like trying to spread again just like spreading the you know love yeah this. yeah that's well, listen, I, I mean, I, I would love to keep talking with you and I know you've got other things to do and our audience does too, but I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, for the, for your generosity of time and talent and uh, as a musician and as an author, um, it is really great to get a chance to talk to you finally. I know we've been um, trying to get together now for several months. So it's been a real, real gift uh, to me to get to do that and to read your book in preparation and to listen to your music as well, which I sometimes hear on the radio. And someday I'll be back at Konalma and we'll be able to hear you live down there. Um, I want to, uh, so in addition to saying thank you to uh, Deanna for being here, I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Michelle and Tisha, uh, for their work in the Barber Library uh, and thank those of you in the audience for being here and for joining us. Um, I'm seeing lots of uh, some thank yous coming through the chat. Uh, so people have uh, are saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll be back here in about a month uh, for another book talk, which you'll be seeing um, advertised. And uh, we hope that you will go to Deanna's website and uh, buy her book and uh, read that and also the album uh, force of nature and get a chant or the cd or recording however it's referred to these days sorry i'm so old school um and and listen uh to her music uh which is is just uh extraordinary um again deanna thank you uh and uh everyone have a happy weekend and happy reading and and happy listening uh to music um bye everybody thanks again